Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I know it's hard and there are other talks going on on campus right now, which makes it difficult, many choices. It's the problem of choice. Um, but I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce uh, our ICE fellow currently, Bertrand Guillaume. He's staying here until March 9th, I think. Um, so he's currently the Associate Professor of Epistemology and History of Science and Technology at Trois University of Technology, which is part of a triplet of universities, apparently, right? right? And it's about a couple of hours from Paris. So Bertrand was educated at Ecole Normale Supérieure and at the Paris Institute of Technology, where he got his PhD. Um, and he's holding this chair of Associate Professor of Epistemology and History of Science, where he also served as a director of the Research Center for Environmental Studies and Sustainability, and then the Department uh, of Humanities, Environment, and Technology as chair or director. Right. And his work is grounded in environmental humanities, and his research is about environmental foresight, the epistemology of social ecological modeling, and the philosophical, anthropological, and anthropological foundations of sustainability with a particular inquiry into the Anthropocene, which happens to be the age we live in. He is an elected member of the French National University Council. And um, his talk today, I hope, won't be too depressing. <laughs> I hope he's going to go the other way, is responsibility against nihilism on the ethics and metaphysics of global environmental change. And let me just say that uh, because we videotape everything, once it's done and we have questions, I'm gonna give you the microphone so you can speak on the microphone for your questions, okay? All right, great return, thanks for coming and thank you. Thank you, thank you Marcelo. Thank you for having invited me at the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth. I uh, would like to stress uh, how much, uh, in my humble view, this is both relevant and important to cross the boundaries between the sciences and the humanities, as you do here, in order to confront the challenges of the forthcoming decades. Um, it has been a wonderful experience being here for several weeks now having time to talk to people, to read, to think, and to write, and enjoy, if I may say so, both ice and snow. <laughs> also, thank you all for being here today to attend this talk on the ethics and metaphysics of global environmental change and responsibility. Finally, please allow me to give special thanks to Amy Flockton for her great support from the very first day of my stay in Hanover. So thank you, Amy. Okay. In 1907, French philosopher Henri Bergson wrote in uh, his book, Creative Evolution, I quote, a century has elapsed since the invention of the steam engine, and we are only just beginning to feel the depth of the shock it gave us. In thousands of years, when seen from the distance, only the broad lines of the present age will still be visible, our wars and our revolutions will count for little, even supposing they are remembered at all. But the steam engine, and the procession of inventions of every kind that accompanied it will perhaps be spoken of if we speak of the bronze or of the cheap stone of prehistoric times. It will serve to define an age. One century later, in the year 2000, the Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen and his fellow colleague biologist Eugene Stormer echo this amazing intuition. The steam engine, they argue, has driven the world into a new era, the Anthropocene, where human activity shapes the Earth's global environment at unprecedented scales. 
making the Holocene no longer adequate to designate our geological epoch. This claim first circulated in the newsletter of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, an international research um, project funded in 1986 in pursuit of knowledge on the planetary dimensions of processes, biogeochemical processes, and likely future changes of the Earth over the century to come. Quite immediately, in 2002, it was popularized well beyond this uh, scientific community of Earth system science through a short article published in the prestigious journal Nature in a piece significantly entitled Geology of Mankind. Soon the Anthropocene reached even wider audiences. In 2011, for instance, The Economist ran a cover on it taking a particularly optimistic stance. It was labeled welcome in, in to, the, to the Anthropocene. In 2015, the Deutsches Museum in Munich hosted a dedicated special exhibition. And the Anthropocene has now become, as you know, an important and widely acknowledged concept, both in academia and society. The debates over its features, um, its causes, its significance have been flourishing. In particular, the onset of the Anthropocene has been much discussed in the scientific community, not only about various stratigraphic markers and different timelines, but also about underlying power and social structures. In this respect, the humanities have been instrumental in broadening the concept <coughs> from the realm of geosciences to the broader realm of society and culture. For instance, the Aus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin hosted a few years ago a very large research project exploring the implication of such a human age for both science and art. And it now offers, with partner institutions, a series of dedicated lectures, accentuating the debate, crystallizing questions, exciting scientists, historians, philosophers, and artists. Thus, the Anthropocene as now popularized refers both to scientific evidence Crudson already focused on the anthropogenic increase in greenhouse gases, but mentioned the depletion of natural resources, the alteration or destruction of ecosystems, and the pollution by damaging or toxic sus substances, and refers to cultural discourses on how our time and its crisis fit into the context of the history of the Earth. To be sure, the capacity of our species to modify its environment is an ancient one. Environmental change and ecological damage have probably gone along with the entire history of human societies their initial development, their successful blossoming, and sometimes their tragic failures. By the end of the 13th century, for instance, London choked with man-made atmospheric pollution because of the burning of low-quality coal, mineral coal. In the late 13th century, the riverside dwellers in Paris suffered from corrupted water because of the slaughtering of livestock and the tanning of skins and hides 
of hundreds of thousands animals a year. Overall, some even argue, medieval man brought about the destruction of Europe's natural environment. I quote. Also, deeper in the past, Lead was already known to be dangerous under Augustus, and Plato describes in the book of Critias the aftermath of the clearing of forests. Jared Diamond's inquiry, in a book you all know, provides with an explicative framework for what caused, more radically, some societies to disappear under environmental pressure such as the Greenland Viking settlements or the civilization of Easter Island. While others, facing similar challenges, manage to avoid failure. Of course, each case throw up a different blend of complex factors. Yet, Diamond's book invites us to consider the past as a warning for what may lie ahead in the future each collapse, or close call, reviewed, involves some ecological feature, such, for instance, as climate change. In this respect, what seems a really genuine novelty in our relations with the environment is the extent of potential ecological damage in scale and scope. For virtually all of human existence on the planet, write the International Geosphere Biosphere Program in a major report synthesis, I quote, interaction with the environment has taken place at the local or at most the regional scale. The environment at the scale of the Earth as a whole has been something within which people have had to operate, subject only to the great forces of nature and the occasional perturbations of extraterrestrial origin. This is, I believe, the true fundamental significance of the Anthropocene, the state of a planet under pressure, under our pressure. Over the past decades, evidence has mounted that we now have to deal with planetary scale effects of human activities on the complex suite of interacting processes that transport and transform matter and energy. Because of this human-induced perturbation of the Earth's system, which provide the conditions for life on the planet, there is now something new under the sun to refer to the work of environmental historian John McNeill. Of course, McNeill's biblical reference to the Ecclesiastes and its cyclical time suggest a rupture, a qualitative leap in our connection with nature. The idea that one generation goes Another comes, but the earth remains the same forever, does not hold anymore. As suggested by a key interdisciplinary symposium held at Clark University in 1987, human action no longer modify the earth, as George Perkins March could foresee in 1864 when his masterwork was published. Human action now transforms the Earth with a magnitude into a pace never seen before. This profound transformation of the global environment, including the lithosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere and the biosphere, is, in turn, likely to dramatically alter our future living conditions. In worst case scenarios, keeping in mind that evidence from past global changes does not support the notion of a single stable equilibrium of the, of the Earth system, 
It could even lead to the inability of the planet, depending on complex feedbacks in the long run. After having sensed the game-changing nature of the steam engine, Bergson already pondered the growing power of humanity in the two sources of morality and religion back in 1932. The workman's tool, I quote, is a continuation of his arm. The tool equipment of humanity is, therefore, a continuation of its body. Nature, in endowing us with an essentially tool-making intelligence, prepared for us in this way a certain expansion. But machines which run on oil or coal, which convert into motion a potential energy stored up for millions of years, have actually imparted to our organism an extension so fast, have endowed it with a power so mighty so out of proportion to the size and strength of that organism that surely none of all this was foreseen in this structural plan of our species. Now in this body, distended out of all proportion, the soul remains what it was, too small to fit in, too weak to guide it. What we need are new reserves of potential energy, moral energy, this time. Yet at the time, Bergson had obviously no idea of atomic bombs or, or, or global environmental crisis. But after World War II, a key symposium was held in Princeton in 1955 exploring what had happened and was happening to the Earth under man's impress. From there, several decades of global environmental scientific assessments, starting with the International Geophysical Year in 1957 and 1958, and subsequent satellite observations, increased the scientific understanding of the quantitative aspects of, of human-induced transformation of the Earth and of the processes responsible for it. They laid the basis for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program I mentioned earlier. And the evidence mounted of a novel age resulting from global environmental change induced by our species, so active and powerful, I quote, that it rivals some great forces of nature. The growing recognition of potentially irreversible and catastrophic human-induced impacts at the planetary scale gradually pushed further um, philosophical and moral inquiries into the implications of the expansion of our technological power. In the context of the nuclear age and growing ecological concerns, German-born Jewish philosopher Hans Jonas was probably the first to size up the measure of the ethical challenges posed by new features of modern technology in both space and time. is a philosophical essays from ancient creed to technological man published in 1974 in english opens for instance with a chapter entitled technology and responsibility reflections on the new tasks of, of ethics first the new environmental threats come with an integrated view of both the globalized human world and the living Earth, which suggests a new sphere of true ethical significance. Two famous pictures can exemplify this fact that 
the earth is small, as French philosopher and futurist Bertrand de Jouvenel once put it. The NASA image, Earth Rise, taken in 1968 during the Apollo 8 mission, I guess, the first manned spaceflight to orbit the moon, and the so-called blue marble, the, the image of the Earth shot from space by the crew of Apollo 17 in 1972. Second, and maybe even more importantly, global environmental threats suggest long-term consequences sometimes in the very wrong run, and through imply a symmetric responsibility to an impossible repro reciprocity with far distant generations. In Crutzen words, unless there is a global catastrophe, a meteoric impact, a world war, or a pandemic, Mankind will remain a major environmental force for many millennia. Consider the global climate, for instance, and imagine that we reach a mean temperature rise of plus three degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Given the feedbacks of this system, even, we, even if we succeed in curbing our carbon emissions, we would undergo a further plus two degrees Celsius rise in temperatures over the next century to reach five. And this is for at least the next 5,000 years according to current models. After the atomic age and the environmental crisis of the late 20th century, Hans Jonas soon figured out that the implicit premises of all previous ethics could no longer hold. I quote from the imperative of responsibility, and here is the German original title. With certain developments of our powers, the nature of human action has changed. And since ethics is concerned with action, it should follow that the changed nature of human action calls for a change in ethics as well. This in the radical sense that the qualitatively novel nature of certain of our actions has opened up a whole new dimension of ethical relevance for which there is no precedent in the standards and canons of traditional ethics. As a matter of fact, Human driving global environmental change raises profound moral issues beyond the golden rule according to which we should treat others as we would wish to be treated. Issues about both the intra and intergenerational -gener responsibilities we now hold commens commensurately with our power. Doing so, not only it updates the concepts of social justice, non-discriminating principle, or moral virtue, it also exhibits unprecedented obligations, derived from the new range and the very nature of current human action, which now affects people on the other side of the globe. Human generations into distant future as well as a good part of the biosphere. As foreseen by Hans Jonas, the entire context of ethics has through fundamentally changed. For in the, technical, in the technological age, the customary idea of human responsibility mismatches the scope and range of the ultimate impact stemming from, as he puts it, the daily routine of modern civilization. Both a simple sentence and a single tagline exemplify Jonah's ethical stance in a nutshell. The philosophical sentence says, I quote from the imperative of responsibility, 
The new nature of our acting calls for a new ethics of long-range responsibility coextensive with the range of our power. Alternatively, one might enjoy referring to the motto now made famous in popular culture with comics and movies, with great power comes great responsibility. The call to caution, Jonas adds, dissonant at, as it sounds to the ear of grandiose capacity, becomes a first duty precisely because of this grandiose capacity. Its, threat, its threats of sudden catastrophe by atomic war is surpassed by its threats of slowly gradual catastrophe where the always next blessings of its peaceful use drown out the voice of distant caution. A short tale of two clocks can illustrate this new moral imperative of ours. The first has historically to do with the atomic bomb. In line with the explicit recognition by Hans Jonas of his intellectual debt to philosophers Günther Anders and Karl Jaspers, respective authors of The Obsolescence of Humankind or and The Atom Bomb and the Future of Man. Well, after World War II, the threats of atomic warfare inspired an attempt to alert to the unprecedented dangers and destruction that nuclear weapons could bring about. To convey this peril and foster responsibility, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists devised in 1947 a doomsday clock with a first setting of seven minutes to midnight. Referring both to the imagery of apocalypse and countdown, the clock conveys man-made existential threats to humanity and the planet, the hour displayed indicating the danger of a civilization threatening technological catastrophe. The closer it is to midnight, the closer the world is to doom. Every year, the board of the Bulletin, which includes several Nobel laureates, analyzes global security issues and decides where the minute hand on the clock should rest as both a visual metaphor for danger and an ethical call to responsibility. It covers possible catastrophic descriptions from climate change since 2007, concluding that, I quote, the dangers posed by climate change are nearly as dire as those posed by nuclear weapons. The effects may be less dramatic in the short term than the destruction that could be wrought by nuclear explosions, but over the next three to four decades, climate change could cause drastic harm to the habitats upon which human societies depend for survival. The current time of the doomsday clock is two minutes to midnight. The second clock is the 10,000 year clock, one of several project, projects led by the Long Now Foundation to foster long-term thinking and responsibility. It is a device of monumental scale to be built inside a mountain uh, in Texas, I believe, which should become an icon for long-term thinking. Powered by energy harvest from the sun, it is designed to tick only once a year and run for 10 millennia, which is about the age of civilization. Thus, it would measure out a future of civilization equal to its past, assuming that the journey is not over, of course. If a clock can keep going for 10 millennia, ask the Long Now Foundations, Shouldn't we make sure our civilization does it as well? Placing so an, a global environmental change in the light of an ethics of the future, 
of an ethics for the future, we should consider our inaction as a moral failure. Yet the extension of our hyperbolic power can even, I argue, be related to the philosophical category known as metaphysics. That is an exploration of the ultimate nature of the world and ourselves, including ontology and theology. One characteristic of global environmental change is deep inertia in relation to the time responses of natural systems to the pressure we now impose on them, a set of causes being likely to trigger very long-term dire consequences. In this regard, again, climate change is rather spectacular. If the projections of the International Energy Agency are to be realized, for instance, sea level rise could amount to about half a meter or so in each of the next centuries, up to six or seven meters. If the world continues down its carbon emitting course, then the average global temperature could rise by the end of the century by up to about five degrees Celsius, which is nine degrees Fahrenheit. A perturbation of the thermoaligned circulation, also known as the ocean conveyor belt, could be triggered within the next decades or, say, centuries. Enormous reserves of methane hydrates could be gradually released in the air, and other runaway climate change scenarios exist. Some warning that the Earth will one day look like Venus if warming continues. Even without such catastrophic events, effects on ecosystem will spread at best over centuries. Deep irreversibility will also prevent us to come back to any previous state of the planet. Whatever the concentration of carbon dioxide at the turn of the 22nd century uh, will be, um, 550 ppm or 750 ppm, whatever, or more, it will remain in the atmosphere for centuries. The eating of oceans will last for millennia. The loss of biodiversity will probably not be offset before millions of years. And the idea that we can influence our global environment to such an extent is not mere speculation. Scientists now believe, for instance, that the basic physics proposed in the framework of the nuclear winter theory is correct, although the magnitude of the effects would be somewhat moderated today. Also, after the Montreal Protocol entered into force in 1989, substances that deplete the stratospheric ozone, uh, the ozone layer, have been banned but it is not expected to recovery before 50 years. More fundamentally, it was a close call, according to Crutzen's Nobel lecture. I quote, had the British Antarctic Survey not persevered in making measurements in the arch Antarctic environment for all those years since the International Geophysical Year, the discovery of the ozone hole may have been substantially delayed. There might thus have been a substantial risk that an ozone hole could also have developed in the higher latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Furthermore, instability, it means chemical instability, makes bromine on an atom-to-atom -atom basis almost a hundred times more dangerous for ozone than chlorine. This brings up the nightmarish thought that if the chemical industry had developed organobromine compounds, 
instead of CFCs. Or alternatively, if chlorine chemistry would have run more like that of bromine, then without any preparedness, we would have been faced with a catastrophic ozone hole everywhere and at all seasons. I can only conclude that mankind has been extremely lucky. Here lies the metaphysical dimension of global environmental change. The stakes are now so huge and potentially so critical in the long range that they could engage our responsibility toward the future to a new level, exhibiting a karma vertigo to our civilization in the words of Stewart Brandt, that is the imposition of a crushing responsibility, paralyzing to contemplate. As soon as 1984, Hans Jonas felt that a kind of metaphysical responsibility has devolved on us with the magnitude of our power relative to this tenuous film of life, that is, since man has become dangerous not only to himself, but to the world biosphere. An iconic picture may exemplify such a feeling. This is a unique photograph of planet Earth taken from space 28 years ago. Um, quite exactly, by the way. By NASA probe Voyager 1, from about 6 million kilometers. We all know it under the name Pale Blue Dot, of course, as popularized by astronomer Carl Sagan in an eponymous book back in 1994 and a decade ago by the um, documentary film An Inconvenient Truth uh, on Al Gore's campaign about global warming. Here is what Sagan famously wrote about this image. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes, settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is what we make our stand. And as far as we know, the same holds for life in general. Yet, although the view from space is invaluable, as stressed by Jonathan Schill in the context of the nuclear predicament, in the last analysis, the view that counts is the one from Earth, from within life. It is a view of both our ancestors and dissidents, of all the past and future generations of mankind, stretching in deep time, a view not only of static picture of the Earth, but of the dynamic evolution of life on it, standing out in the darkness of space. From this point of view, not only is the Earth the only world known so far to arbor life, as stated by Sagan, but also it took a long journey to get there. From the Big Bang, about 20 billion years ago, <laughs> okay, to the birth of stars, then the formation of the Earth four and a half billions of years ago. The adventure went on farther with the evolution of life, the emergence of the primate order, the appearance of mankind, and eventually the rise of civilization only a few thousand 
uh, years ago. While some argue that simple life could be common and widespread in the universe, according to the rare earth hypothesis proposed by uh, Donald Brownlee and Peter Ward, very few planets in other system would offer the prerequisite long-term stability for a continued evolution of life, which the emergence of complex biology requires. On the one hand, we know <coughs> that the Earth offers Goldilocks conditions, even if our knowledge of life in rather extreme environments, radioactive, acid, hot, dark, has made huge progress in the last decades. On the other hand, the emergence of advanced life on Earth appears almost accidental. A few weeks ago, for instance, scientists discovered that 66 million years ago, an asteroid impact in what is now Mexico led to a vast ecosystem collapse, including the extinction of dinosaurs, and changed the history of life on Earth. It is believed that the probability of the appearance of mammals after such an impact on the surface of the Earth was very low. So while the future does not need us, as computer scientist Bill Joy once claimed, it might be that as a single non-intelligent species in the galaxy, our fate has, contrarywise, a cosmic significance, to use a striking expression of astronomer royal Sir Martin Rees. Now, to conclude this talk, it does not matter that our abode is not at the center of our solar system, our solar system not at the center of the universe. Likewise, it does not matter that mankind has a common ancestor with apes or even with some primitive unicellular organism. It does not matter whether we are the result of a Greek cosmic scheme or some mysterious impulse in matter, or the mere accidental consequence of a complex and chaotic suit of causes and effects, a pure blend of chance and necessity. Either way, we are a miracle. The living Earth is a miracle, and we, you, me, both as uh, individual and as a species, we are unique as well because the same abilities that give us enormous power also give us the capacity for change through the ability to shape and care for the future. The responsibility we have to preserve our home planet as well as the continuity of the biosphere and in it a certain idea of humanity is now paramount. The ethics and metaphysics of global environmental change suggests that extreme prospect could indeed establish the definitive proof of the death of meaning. But staring at their shadows might as well trigger a kind of symbolic upsurge needed into the world. What might also be a simple evo evolutionary test would then, at least, safeguard a slight idea of meaning in the face of nihilism and give and prove a genuine significance to our existences as individuals, as people, and as humankind. Whether or not there has been a purpose in the universe, we have one now, which is to care for life and to care for the future. Basically, this would give meaning to stardust. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand, for this lecture. I hope everybody took your message to heart. You know, that's the, so um, we have questions from the audience. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to. Any comments? Anyone? Sure. One of the things that I find is not discussed too much is that it is actually economically beneficial to do certain things as far as helping with global environmental change. 
Um, I operate my house and my car totally photovoltaically and uh, has saved me about $7,000 a year between the two of them. I agree. David. So you, you spoke about uh, a change <coughs> in the ethics of man due to the, the changing circumstances that we've brought on ourselves on this earth. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the role of like natural philosophy uh, with ethics. If, if the evolution of ethics requires it to merge with natural philosophy, that they are in fact one and the same. Um, yeah, just any thoughts on that? Not really, that's a difficult question. Um, but I, I, yeah, I would say that they probably are sisters in a way. So probably having more discussions between two strands of research is always beneficial. And um, it might be that it would be quite helpful in the future to discuss these new ethics I'm talking about, to blend those um, traditions together. So I would be supportive of that. Right, so you know, one of the things that the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement does, which is the, what we call it, the good eyes, you know, to differentiate it from the other eyes, um, is, is to try to promote this kind of conversation, you know, between the sciences and the humanities, you know, and this sort of worry that um, Bertrand has brought out, you know, that uh, we have this machine, so Bergson, huh, amazing, that, uh, that this machine that um, is beneficial in some ways, but is also highly destructive in other ways, you know, is changing the way we live, it's something that brings together worries from scientists and from different kinds of humanists. And that's the sort of conversation we like to have. You know, um, One of the things that I have written a lot about this topic, um, actually, and the need for a new morality. I call it morality because of the respect for life, any kind of life, in fact, not just human life, but any kind of life. Um, and one of the things, and you know, being out there writing to NPR and, and being in the public sphere, one of the things that is very discouraging to me, and I want to hear what you think about that, is that people don't care. Most people don't care. It is incredibly difficult to change people's outlook and to make them realize that there is a moral imperative right now, at this very moment, if you care about future generations, right? And you say these things, and even in an audience, I was in a conference in Japan about the origin of life in January, and I gave a talk which was basically the history of life on Earth, and at the very end I put some uh, uh, PowerPoints out saying, we are at a very difficult moment, and we need to change. We need to change the way we eat, the way we deal with you know, uh, our environment for what we plant or we shouldn't be planting, et cetera, et cetera. And I could see that even with scientists who are supposed to be people studying life, there was an immediate kind of, I don't want to stop eating meat. I love my steak, you know? And even if you realize all the things that it does. So it's kind of a complicated issue. How do we convince people that this is serious? without them feeling the immediate pressure for change, which is what a war does, or as you said, other kind of global environments. That to me is the big challenge. You know, how do you go out and you tell people that, folks, you need to change, otherwise the consequences are gonna be really very bad in the next few decades. We're not talking 150 years from now, we're talking 10, 15, 20 years from now. You know, when Manhattan starts getting submerged and stuff like that. They're all going to come to New Hampshire, you know, five million New Yorkers are going to come. So, you know, how do you deal with this? And how do you try to change the public perception of it? That, to me, is the big challenge. 
you want to comment? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. It's almost tragic, I would say, in the, um, the ancient sense, I mean, of, you know, you know that it will happen, it, it is happen anyway. Um, and uh, scientists, by the way, are, are, at least those I talk to, are quite pessimistic because of that. Much more pessimistic than their scientific message uh, express. Um, so, um, well, two elements for optimism. The fact that uh, there is a new generation coming and we can hope that also as teachers we can make them feel and understand things better than we did. Um, and also the fact that um, the message is now um, also um, held by artists and maybe the, the, the appeal to, to feelings might, might be an option rather than only reason, reasoning and you know this is cold scientific fact but also just like those beautiful images uh, from deep universe of the, the living earth or but I, I have I'm not a magician, so I don't have the solution you, yeah. you're looking for. Right. Well, anyway, I, this conversation is one that is definitely going to continue, so please stay Hope tuned. So. And, oh, you have a question. Oh, I have something about the comments. Please. Yeah. Um, no, thank you both so much for that last comment. Um, I've been thinking about, about that quite a bit this term. And I think that Part of it also, um, and this was reflected actually in some of the, the books that you that you mentioned. Uh, for example, Jared Diamond's Collapse. I haven't read that book, but just the title and your description makes me think that if the thesis is sort of oh, this environmental catastrophe leads to the collapse of civilization, if that's the moral imperative, you know, avoid the collapse of civilization, avoid these doomsday scenarios. I mean, it's kind of it's sad, but understandable. I think why people are hesitant to act. Um, it's so, I mean, well, climate denialism, like climate change denial in the United States, I mean, part of that's probably money in politics, right? But then, I mean, also, it's so pleasant to think that there's nothing wrong and not and avoid that guilt and to think that, you know, we're not responsible. So I wonder if mm, it would be possible or make any sense to instead of direct the moral imperative out of avoiding this horrible thing that's happening, instead of moral imperative to work toward a sustainable future that's m more sustainable, but also more just and more equitable and more beautiful. Um, yeah, I don't know, there might be a more optimistic outlook as well. Maybe we need to be less catastrophic and more kind of, you know, find a different, there are different ways of living with the planet, you know, and, and and there's nothing wrong with changing slowly what we're doing, you know. Yeah, all right. Any more comments or questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was just curious from anyone in the audience and particular lecture, um, in terms of the, in terms of inspiring people to even necessarily, maybe even just feel what we're feeling in terms of the sense of urgency of we need to do something because that's ultimately the goal like if everyone can feel that then everyone will ideally feel some sense of responsibility in some sense to act and curtail whatever behaviors that we know are leading us to some doomsday scenario but i was wondering how do you on what authority do you in a sense argue a moral imperative, especially in the kind of a postmodern age of moral relativism where traditionally you could invoke an authority of God or some sort of religious tradition or institution. What do you invoke now, especially since the, the plane seems to be so relative and it's all about, oh, well, here's what I feel, here's what I feel, well, those are your facts, these are my facts, and it's, how do you really argue anything, particularly something as seemingly intangible as moral imperative and then people I feel like these will say, well, data, but you know, in data science and whatever AI we can think of and find the data and then prove a point using that, but then we know that that's subject to biases as well. So what do you think are valid ways these days to really 
impose or prove a point. Um, well, maybe just a short answer. Um, basically, this is one of the problems we have. How to uh, have people, um, how to mobilize people. And it, it's quite interesting to me that in the last few years, some moral authorities, I mean religious ones, uh, expressed some worries and sometimes uh, uh, wrote calls to action. It's, uh, for instance, the case uh, of uh, the Pope Francis. I don't know if you know the Laudato Si uh, bubble. So it's, it's a bubble. I don't know. But uh, and and it seems that uh, I, I was talking uh, before of artists. But uh, it seems also that uh, religions and probably other um, institutions, moral based institutions, not in religion, in the in the realm of religions, are. are moving towards um, calls to their believers or um, people. So maybe it's also something that should be uh, considered with a bit of optimism. I have an answer for that too, um, but I don't want to take it away, but I think we need some sort of new unifying myth that goes beyond tribalism. Because that's really what we need, you know. And, and at this point in, in in our history, we are facing not just oh, it's it's the Africans or it's the Asians. No, it's the world. It's the humanity. It's our the future as a species, and that to me has a an ethical force that very few other things can have. You know, I mean, if you don't want to look at the reality, that's cool. I mean, that's just a choice, and that's why you have your tribal more imperative to do this or that. But I think there are ways to kind of create this new vision which goes beyond all of that. And if it's forceful enough and convincing enough and maybe pleasant enough, then people will slowly change and at least your generation will do something more positive about this than mine has. All right, guys, well, thank you very much. And I hope you stay tuned for more things that we do. Bye, thank you.